You have just graduated from university, and you just got hired by Tesla. After a few weeks on the job, you have just built your first autonomous car, and you are ready to test it on the road. So, you take it to the nearest highway to test drive it. At time t equals zero, you launch the car from the position x0 equals zero with a constant speed of 60 kilometers per hour. Now, being a good engineer, you want to track the position and speed of the car at regular intervals. For example, every hour you want to know where your car is. In a perfect world, tracking the car would be a piece of cake. The speed of the car would be constant, 60 km per hour, and its position at time t plus 1 would simply be its position at time t plus the speed times delta t. Usually, we like to write these types of equations in matrix and vector format for convenience. So the car's position and speed will evolve according to this simple linear dynamical system. If the last year of 2020 is anything to go by, the world is actually far from perfect. Your initial estimates for the speed and position of the car are probably not perfectly accurate. For instance, the speedometer that you use might give you noisy measurements of the speed. You check the manual provided by the manufacturer for the measuring instruments that you use, and you find that the measurements that you get are noisy and the noise can be modeled by some Gaussian variable with the following covariance matrix. The way to interpret this matrix sigma zero is that it represents your uncertainty about the state of the system. The first diagonal element represents the uncertainty that you have about the position of the car and the second diagonal element represents your uncertainty about the speed. The off-diagonal elements represent the correlation between noise in measurements to the speed and to the position of the car. Another problem you might face is that the conditions on the road are not perfect, especially if you live in California, meaning that the nominal dynamical system that governs the movement of the car might get perturbed. We like to model this kind of perturbances as Gaussian noise with a known covariance matrix that we call P. All right, now an hour has passed. What would be your best guess for where the car position is right now? And what is your guess for the car's speed? You could say, let me ignore all the imperfections of the world and follow this idealized dynamical system and see where it leads me. The math in this case is pretty simple. The car would remain at the constant speed of 60 km per hour, and after one hour, it would be one kilometer away from the starting position. Now, all of a sudden, you remember something. You actually have a GPS installed in the car, and that GPS can give you measurements of the position of the car every hour. Perfect. You check the GPS data, and it's telling you that the car is 0.8 km away from the starting position. This GPS, however, does not measure the speed of the car. So now, here is a question. Which one of these two measurements would you trust more? The one you have predicted by ignoring all the imperfections of the world, or the estimate that you obtained from your measuring instruments? More interestingly though, can you combine both of these estimates to get a new estimate that is more accurate than both estimates individually? For instance, if you had to guess, you would say that the true position of the car is probably between the 0.8 and 1 km mark, and as a consequence, the speed of the car should probably be lower than 60 km per hour. But how much less than 60 km per hour exactly? And where exactly in the interval 0.81 would you say the car's position is right now? As you might have guessed, the answer probably depends on what we know about the size of the noise in our initial estimates, in our measuring instruments, in our model of the dynamical system of the car? The answer to this question is what Kalman filters are all about. As we will see, a Kalman filter is an algorithm for estimating the state of the system, for example, the speed and position of the car, using past and possibly noisy observations, and current and possibly noisy measurements of that system. More specifically, let's say that this is the underlying dynamical system. And let's say that this is the measurement that we get. 
So at every time t, we get a measurement that is a random variable yt. So you can see that yt is a linear function of the state xt, plus some noise v that we model as a random Gaussian variable with a known covariance matrix q. In the toy example we just saw, h was the row vector 1, 0, because the only thing we measured through the GPS is the position, and that was the first component of our state vector xt. Kalman filtering is a two-step process. Here is how it works. The first step is called the prediction step. In this step, you take whatever prior estimates you had about the state of the system, you run these estimates through the idealized version of the dynamical system, and that would be your prediction for the state of the system at the next time step. I'm going to mark these estimates with a minus sign upper script. The reason I do that is because this will not be our final estimate, since we have not yet incorporated the information that we get from our measuring instruments. Another important thing we have to do in this prediction step is to think about how our noise covariance matrix propagates through the system. In the case where we have perfect estimates of our state variables, i.e. when sigma t is zero, the only uncertainty is going to come from the perturbation to our dynamical system, i.e. from the matrix P. In general, though, sigma t would not be zero. So when you run this sigma t through the idealized system and you work out the math, you realize that we need to add an additional term, a sigma a transpose. So what does this mean for our toy example? Well, in the prediction step, we simply predict that the car would be in this yellow spot. So now the question is, how can I incorporate the additional information I get from my measuring instruments to update and improve this prediction? That is done in the second step of Kalman filtering, which is appropriately called the update step. In this step, we take the results of our prediction in terms of the state of the system and the covariance matrix of the noise, and we take the new measurements that we made about the system, which are noisy, remember, and we combine both in a single estimate, which would be our final estimate of the system. So how does this work? What we need to compute is the surprise term. The surprise term is the difference between what you have predicted and what you have measured. The larger this term is, the more surprised you are and the more you question everything that you learned in university. Now, you look at this picture and you need to decide by how much you need to correct your prediction based on this surprise term. And for that, you need to see how much you trust your prediction, which is measured by this covariance matrix, and how much you trust your measuring instruments, which is measured by this covariance matrix. More precisely, you need to compute this ratio, sometimes called a Kalman ratio. The sigma term is your uncertainty about your prediction for the position, and this Q term is your uncertainty about the GPS measurements. This ratio is always between minus 1 and 1. If it is 0, it means that the sigma term is 0, meaning that you have complete faith in the predictions you made, so you are basically saying, my car is in the yellow spot. On the other hand, if it is 1, it means that the Q term is 0 which means that you completely trust your GPS and you're saying that the car is in the blue spot. In practice though, this ratio will be somewhere between 0 and 1. So what you do is that you take your prediction and you correct it with the term k times the surprise term delta x. The bigger the ratio, the bigger the correction. So this is how we correct our prediction for the position. But now, how do we correct our prediction for the speed of the car? Remember, our GPS does not measure the speed at all. So we need to somehow use what we know about another state variable, the position, to infer how to correct our prediction for the speed. And this is the magic of Kalman filters. You do not need to measure everything all the time. Partial measurements are still okay. So what is the correct Kalman coefficient to use here? You look at a Kalman coefficient that is very similar to what we had before, except that now the numerator is replaced by the off-diagonal term 
sigma x x dot, which represents the correlation between speed and position. And this makes sense. This is the term you want to use to convert an information about the position to an information about the speed. In the worst case, if the noise in the speed and position are independent from each other, this ratio will be zero, which means that what we know about the position of the car would be completely useless as far as the speed is concerned. And there is an identical formula for correcting our prediction for the speed. More generally, going back to the general formula, you get the following equations for correcting your predictions for the state of the system and the covariance matrix of the noise. There are two things I'm not doing here. I'm not telling you how to derive these two expressions in full detail, and I'm not telling you how to compute this common term k, which is a matrix in the more general case. There are countless references online, including Wikipedia, for that, and I believe that you are in an excellent position to follow what's happening there if you have understood the intuition of Kalman filters explained in this video. Thank you very much, and see you next time.